Isn't this amazing? I mean, we got good weather, we have enough land for grazing our animals, and we don't go to war with each other. Yeah, I sure hope this stays this way. In the sweeping savannas of southern Africa, the Bantu-speaking people found themselves all spread out, with different cultures and languages. There were a bunch of traditional communities, not fully formed nations yet. Especially in the east, it was dominated by the Nguni people, organized into small clans made up mostly of one tribe each. Each group was its own political entity, and in what would later be Zululand and Natal, hundreds of these tiny tribes popped up. At the head of each group was the Inkosi. He made the big decisions on laws and religion. Hey guys, the fact that I'm your leader, I also happen to have superpowers. See? So don't try to think funny, because I can see everything. And I'm not just saying this because I want to scare you. I'm saying this because I want to scare you. I mean, I, because it's true, not because I want to scare you guys. So, anyways. But to be fair, he wasn't a total dictator. It was a balanced government. The Inkozi picked Indunas from non-royal families to govern smaller areas. That way, they wouldn't try to snatch his power. The reason why there were so many subgroups was because it was common for these chiefdoms to split up. There was enough space for people to migrate to Zandi, enough land for animal grazing. And less people meant easy governance. These usually happened when an Inkosi died. Okay, the Inkosi just died. I think I should be king. No way, I was his favorite kid. No, you weren't. Yes, I was. Fights over who would rule after the death of Inkosi happened quite a lot. Now there was a tribe who had an Inkosi named Malandela, who had two sons, Zulu and Kwabe. According to ancient stories passed down, the Amazulu traced their roots back to the Nguni peoples. The Nguni's descendants included the Xhosa, Luzumane, Swazi and Ndebele tribes. Luzumane was the ancestor of the Amazulu. His son Malandela took over, and then Malandela's two boys, Kwabe and Zulu, marked a huge turning point in Amazulu history. Before Malandela died, he said Kwabe would inherit everything, including being the next Inkosi. When their dad Malandela kicked the bucket, they had a fight over who should be king. Then their mother Nozidia came up with a solution. Okay, how about both of you become kings? How is that possible? Well, you will stay here and take over your father, and you will come with me, and we're going to start a new kingdom. What do you think? Huh, sounds about right. The tribe split into the Kwabe with Inkosi Kwabe as their leader, and the Amazulu with Inkosi Zulu as their Inkosis. So, Kwabe stuck around at his dad's homestead, expanding the clan over there. And that's how Malandela's people split into the Amakwabe and the Amazulu, two new groups going their own ways in that region. The Amazulu settled between the Black and White Umfolosi rivers, building their homes by the streams. With more and more tribes popping up, fights started breaking out over land and power. Now back in the day, wars between tribes went from little skirmishes to outright brawls by the end of the 1700s. That's when the big Duanwe kingdom led by Tswide in the northwest and the Tethwa kingdom led by King Dinkiswayo in the southeast started throwing their weight around. They took control of all the smaller and weaker neighboring tribes and clans, reshaping the political scene. Most tribes got dominated by the mighty Duanwe or Tethwa kingdoms. King Dinkiswayo's Tethwa crew assimilated the Zulus and took over the area between the Black Mfolozi and Malathuze rivers. So the big kings were taking over, but the smaller chiefdoms could still do their own thing. Hey guys, uh, I don't really own you, but you have to acknowledge me before you do anything really significant or big. Make sure I approve of it first. But this is to your kingdom. You do whatever you want. Not really. You get what I'm saying. And by the way, don't forget to send me cows from time to time to keep me happy. Do you understand? Uh, not really. Well, good. Good. 
During all this change, one brave young man was coming up in Dingiswayo's army, an exiled Zulu prince named Shaka. He had just come back home after his dad, King Senzanga Kona, died. Shaka and his mom got exiled way back when he was a baby. With Dingi Swayo's blessing, Shaka killed his half-bro and became the new Zulu chief. Now in charge, Shaka was ready to shake things up all over Southeast Africa. King Shaka's rise kicked off a wild era with lots of political changes and fights in the region. This whole system is stupid. What? I'm saying this whole system of having so many independent clans and chiefs is stupid. I don't get what you're saying, man. Look, I say we bring everyone under one leadership. Uh, I don't think people would be on board with that. Who cares? These guys don't exist yet. So that basically means we can do whatever we want. Shaka didn't want small semi-free tribes anymore. He wanted to group them into one powerful Zulu nation. At first, he went raiding smaller tribes for cattle. During these raids, he started rethinking how to fight wars. The normal spear-chucking battles seemed weak to him. The usual way to fight was for two armies to stand apart and hurl spears back and forth until someone gave up. Before uniting tribes, Shaka knew he had to reinvent combat in the south. He changed up the Zulu army by inventing battle tactics, making it a fierce force to take over the area. With smart military plans and intense discipline from Shaka, the Zulu regiments became unstoppable. The first people Shaka beat in battle was the Lengani tribe, which was his own mother's tribe. He basically just surrounded their main village and they gave up without a fight. Next was the Buthelezi tribe under Chief Pungashi. Shaka's regiments wrecked their homes and took all their cattle, women and kids. Pungashi ran off to get help from King Tsuide and the Ndwandwe tribe up north. To keep control, Shaka put his own dude in charge of the Buthelezi. You remember the Kwabe tribe? They were now one of the biggest kingdom in the area. They ruled a huge area from the Mulatuze River to the sea. The Kwabe had already taken over smaller clans like the Ngageni, Kele, and Lutuli. At this time, the Kwabe were a significantly powerful kingdom. They were the brother kingdom of the Zulus and would be a perfect ally of the Zulus' right. Well, Shaka went in hard and wrecked them, assimilated their young men into his army. Shaka planned with King Dingiswayo to team up and crush the Dwandwe. Okay, so the plan is set. Just make sure you don't attack him by yourself because you're probably gonna get killed. Uh, Dingiswayo just attacked Zwida by himself and got killed. The Dwandwe wrecked Dingiswayo's forces and killed him. Right after Dingiswayo died, his kingdom started falling apart. Shaka saw it falling and knew he needed a different plan to control the region. Zwide and Shaka fought significant wars. However, the final showdown would come in 1818 on the historical Kokli Hill. with an army of just around 4,000 warriors versus Zwide's 10,000 warriors. Zwide had number superiority and was confident. However, Shaka was crafty and he used decoys to pull some of Zwide's army away, evening the numerical odds a bit. Still, when the two armies met at Kokli Hill, Zwide's son, who was in command of this regiment, which had more troops than those of Shaka, charged towards the Zulus Shaka's men held off wave after wave of attacks all day. The hilly terrain meant Swede couldn't swarm them with numbers, and Shaka's up-close fighting style with short stabbing spears gave his smaller force an edge. After several charges, and with no breakthrough, Swede's men began to be exhausted due to the repeated uphill waves of attack, which was successfully repulsed by the Zulus. Seeing the exhausted and Dadwi men, Shaka unleashed his reserves hidden at the top of the hill, using their speed and the cow horn tactic to give the finishing blow. 
Storybox Audio. When the dust settled, around 2,000 Zulus were dead or hurt bad. But 7,500 in Dadwe got wrecked. Shaka proved he was a strategic genius that day, and his changes to tactics and weapons worked. Zuide eventually fled north with a huge number of his people and established himself further north, leaving Shaka as the sole powerful king in eastern South Africa 